Welcome back to Twelfth Night, the radio show. Our story sure has gone off the rails, hasn't it? It seems as if Viola's manly disguise is so convincing that everyone in Illyria is confusing her with her brother, Sebastian, who has recently come to town. To clarify everything, Orsino is in love with Olivia, who is in love with his new assistant, Cesario, who is actually Viola in disguise, but Viola loves Orsino, who loves Olivia, and now it seems Viola's brother, Sebastian, is also into Olivia, but Olivia doesn't know he is Sebastian and not Cesario, who, again, is actually Viola. Did that clear things up? Oh, I almost forgot. Malvolio, Olivia's butler, is also in love with Olivia because Mariah, Olivia's maid, wrote him a forged letter claiming Olivia was in love with him. It looks like this prank has gone too far, though, as Malvolio has been tied up and stuffed into a closet because the household thinks he has gone insane. Mariah seems to be preparing another part of the prank with Festi, our resident comedian. He's carrying a costume of some kind. Nay, I prithee, make him believe thou art Sir Topus the Curate. Do it quickly. I'll call Sir Toby the Walst. Mariah leaves to fetch Sir Toby, leaving Festi alone with Malvolio. He puts on his costume, which seems to be that of... a priest. Well, I'll put it on, and I will dissemble myself in it, and I would I were the first that ever dissembled in such a gown. I am not tall enough to become the function well, nor lean enough to be thought a good student, but to be said an honest man and a good housekeeper goes as fairly as to say a careful man and a great scholar. The competitors enter. Sir Toby, Olivia's uncle, rushes excitedly into the room with Mariah. He sees Festy dressed as a priest and decides to play along. Jove bless thee, Master Parson. Bonos dies, Sir Toby, for as the old hermit of Prague that never saw a pen and ink very wittily said to a niece of King Gorboduc, that, that is, is. So I, being Master Parson, am Master Parson, for what is that but that, and is but is. To him, Sir Topas. Oh. <clears throat> what ho, I say? Peace in this prison. Oh, the knave counterfeits well, a good knave. Who calls there? Sir Topas, the curate, who comes to visit Malvolio, the lunatic. Oh, Sir Topas, Sir Topas, good Sir Topas, go to mine lady. Out! Hyperbolical fiend, how vexest thou this man? Talkest thou nothing but of ladies? Well said, Master Parson. Sir Topas, never was man thus wronged. Good Sir Topas, do not think I am mad. They have laid me here in hideous darkness. Fie, 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 thou dishonest Satan. I call thee by the most modest terms, for I am one of those gentle ones that will use the devil himself with courtesy. Sayest thou this house is dark? I am not mad, Sir Topas. I say to you, this house is dark. <laughs> Madman thou errest! I say there is no darkness but ignorance, in which thou art more puzzled than the Egyptians in their fog. I say this house is as dark as ignorance, though ignorance were as dark as hell. And I say there was never man thus abused. I am no more mad than you are. Make the trial of it in, in any constant question. <laughs> what is the opinion of Pythagoras concerning wild fowl? Um, um, th that the soul of our grandam might haply inhabit a bird. What thinkest thou of his opinion? Well, I think nobly of the soul and no way approve his opinion. <sighs> Fair thee well remain thou still in darkness. Thou shalt hold the opinion of Pythagoras ere I will allow of thy wits, lest thou dispossess the soul of thy grandam. Fare thee well. Sir Topis, Sir Topis, my most exquisite <laughs> Sir Topis. Nay, I am for all waters. Thou mightst have done this without thy beard and gown. He sees thee not. To him in thine own voice, and bring me word how thou findest him. If he may be conveniently delivered, I would he were, for I am now so far in offence with my niece that I cannot pursue with any safety the sport to the upshot. Mariah, come by and by to my chamber. Sir Toby and Mariah retire to his room, leaving Festy and Malvolio. Hey, Robin, 
Jolly Robin, tell me how thy lady dies. Fool? My lady is unkind, purdy. A, a fool? Alas, why is she so? Fool, I say. She loves another. Uh, who calls her? <laughs> Good fool, as ever thou wilt deserve well at my hand. Help me to light and pen, ink and paper. As I am a gentleman, I will live to be thankful to thee for it. <laughs> Master Malvolio. Aye, good fool. Oh, alas, sir, how fell you besides your five wits? Fool, there was never a man so notoriously abused. I am as well in my wits, fool, as, as, as thou art. But as well? Oh, then you are mad indeed, if you be no better in your wits than a fool. They have here propertied me, keep me in darkness, send ministers to me, asses, and, and do all they can to face me out of my wits. Oh, oh advise you what you say. The minister's here. Ma oh. Oh. Malvolio, Malvolio, thy wits, the heavens, restore. Endeavor thyself to sleep and leave thy vain bibble babble. Sir Topis! Maintain no words with him, good fellow. Who I, sir? Oh, not I, sir. God be with you, good Sir Topis. Merry, amen. I will, sir, I will. Fool, 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 I say. Oh, alas, sir, be patient. Oh, what say you, sir? I'm shent for speaking to you. Good fool, help me to some light. And, and some paper, I tell thee, I am as well in my wits as any man in Illyria. Well a day that you were, sir. By this hand I am! <laughs> Good fool, some ink, paper, and light, and convey what I will set down to my lady. It shall advantage thee more than ever the bearing of a letter did. I will help you to it. B but tell me true, are you not mad indeed? Or do you but counterfeit? Believe me, I am not. I tell thee true. No, oh, nay. I'll ne'er believe a madman till I see his brains. I will fetch you light and paper and ink. Oh, fool, I'll, I'll requite it in the highest degree. I, I prithee be gone. I am gone, sir, and anon, sir, I'll be with you again in a trice. Like to the old vice, your need to sustain who with dagger of lath in his rage and his wrath cries aha to the devil like a mad lad pare thy nails dad a jew good man devil Sebastian, Viola's brother, who Olivia has mistaken for Cesario, paces back and forth in front of a chapel. He and Olivia must be getting married. Well, that was fast. But it looks like Sebastian might be having second thoughts. This is the air. That is the glorious sun. This pearl she gave me, I do feel it and see it. And though tis wonder that enraps me thus, yet tis not madness. Where's Antonio, then? I could not find him at the elephant, yet there he was, and there I found this credit that he did range the town to seek me out. His counsel now might do me golden service, for though my soul disputes well with my sense that this may be some error but no madness, yet doth this accident and flood of fortune so far exceed all instance, all discourse, that I am ready to distrust mine eyes and wrangle with my reason that persuades me to any other trust but that I am mad, or else the lady's mad. Yet, if t'were so, she could not sway her house, command her followers, take and give back affairs in their dispatch, with such smooth, discreet, and stable bearing as I perceive she does. There's something in it that is deceivable. But here the lady comes. Olivia glides out of the chapel in a gorgeous white gown, clutching a lovely bouquet of garden-fresh gardenias. The priest waits at the door of the chapel expectantly. <clears throat> Blame not this haste of mine. If you mean well, now go with me and with this holy man into the chantry by. There before him and underneath that consecrated roof may live at peace. He shall conceal it well as you are willing it shall come to note. What time we will our celebration keep according to my birth. What do you say? I'll follow this good man and go with you, and having sworn truth ever will be true. Then lead the way, good father, and heaven so shine that they may fairly note this act of mine. It's only been a few hours, and Olivia's household has already devolved into chaos. 
Fabian, one of Olivia's attendants, chases Festi out of the house. Festi has a letter from Malvolio in his hand. Now, as thou lovest me, let me see his letter. Good Master Fabian, grant me another request. Anything. Do not desire to see this letter. This is to give a dog, and in recompense, desire my dog again. Orsino and Viola, who is still disguised as Cesario, interrupt Fabian and Festi. Belong you to the Lady Olivia, friends. I, sir, we are some of her trappings. I know thee well, how dost thou, my good fellow? Truly, sir, the better for my foes and the worse for my friends. Just the contrary, the better for thy friend. Oh, no, sir, the worse. Uh, how can that be? Mary, sir, they praise me and make an ass of me. Now my foes tell me plainly I am an ass, so that by my foes, sir, I profit in the knowledge of myself, and by my friends, I am abused. So that conclusions to be as kisses, if your four negatives make your two affirmatives, why, then, the worse for my friends and the better for my foes? Why, this is excellent! Oh, by my troth, sir, no. Oh. Though it please you to be one of my friends. Thou shalt not be the worse for me. There's gold. But that it would be double dealing, sir. I would you could make it another? Oh, you give me ill counsel. Put your grace in your pocket, sir, for this once, and let your flesh and blood obey it. Uh, you can fool no more money out of me at this throw. If you will let your lady know I am here to speak with her and uh, bring her along with you, it may awake my bounty further. Uh, oh, Mary, sir. Lullaby to your bounty till I come again. I, I go, sir, but I would not have you think that my desire of having is the sin of covetousness. But as you say, sir, let your bounty take a nap. I'll awake it anon. Festi returns to the house. A police car parks on the street, and out come Antonio and two police officers who seem desperate to speak with Orsino. Here comes the man, sir, that did rescue me. That face of his I do remember well, yet when I saw it last, he was besmeared as black as Vulcan in the smoke of war. A bobbling vessel was he captain of, for shallow draught and bulk unprizable, with which such scathful grapple did he make with the most noble bottom of our fleet, that very envy and the tongue of loss cried fame and honor on him. What's the matter? Orsino, this is that Antonio that took the phoenix and her fraught from candy. Here in the streets, desperate of shame and state, in private brabble did we apprehend him. He did me kindness, sir, drew on my side, but in conclusion put strange speech upon me. I know not what t'was but distraction. Notable pirate, thou saltwater thief. What foolish boldness brought thee to their mercies, whom thou, in terms so bloody and so dear, hast made thine enemies? Orsino, noble sir, be pleased that I shake off these names you give me. Antonio never yet was thief or pirate, though I confess on base and ground enough Orsino's enemy. A witchcraft drew me hither, that most ungrateful boy there by your side did I redeem. A wreck past hope he was, his life I gave him, it did thereto add my love, without retention or restraint, all his in dedication. For his sake did I expose myself, pure for his love, into the danger of this adverse town. Drew to defend him when he was beset, where being apprehended, his false cunning, not meaning to partake with me in danger, taught him to face me out of his acquaintance, and grew a twenty years removed thing, while one would wink. Denied me mine own purse, which I had recommended to his use not half an hour before. How can this be? When came he to this town? Today, my lord, and for three months before, no interim, not a minute's vacancy, both day and night did we keep company. Olivia, having heard the commotion outside, hurries out of her house to the front yard, accompanied by Mariah. Here comes the countess, now heaven walks on earth. But for thee, fellow, fellow, thy words are madness. Three months this youth hath tended upon me. But more of that anon. Officer, take him aside. What would my lord but that he may not have wherein Olivia may seem serviceable? Cesario, you do not keep your promise with me. Madam. Gracious Olivia. What do you say, Cesario? Good, my lord. My lord would speak, my duty hushes me. If it be aught to the old tune, my lord... It is as fat and fulsome to mine ear as howling after music. Still so cruel. Still so constant, lord. What, to perverseness? 
you uncivil lady to whose ingrate and unauspicious altars my soul, the faithfulest offerings, have breathed out that air devotion tender. What shall I do? Even what it please, my lord, that shall become him. Oh, why should I not, had I the heart to do it, kill what I love? A savage jealousy that sometimes savors nobly. But hear me this. Since you to non-regardance cast my faith, and that I partly know the instrument that screws me from my true place in your favor, live you the marble-breasted tyrant still. But this your minion, whom I know you love, and whom, by heaven, I swear, I tender dearly, him will I tear out of that cruel eye where he sits crowned in his master's spite. Come, boy, with me. My thoughts are ripe in mischief. I'll sacrifice the lamb that I do love to spite a raven's heart within a dove. And I, most jocund, apt, and willing to do you rest a thousand deaths would die. Where goes Cesario? After him I love. More than I love these eyes, more than my life, more by all mores than e'er I shall love wife. If I do feign, you witnesses above, punish my life for tainting of my love. I me detested. How am I beguiled? Who does beguile you? Who does do you wrong? Hast thou forgot thyself? Is it so long? Call forth the Holy Father. Mariah runs in the direction of the chapel to fetch the priest. Come. Away. Whither, my lord? Cesario, husband, stay. Husband? I husband. Can he that deny? In her husband, Sirrah? No, my lord, not I. Alas, it is the baseness of thy fear that makes thee strangle thy propriety. Fear not, Cesario, take thy fortunes up. Be that thou knowest thou art, and then thou art as great as that thou fearest. Mariah and the priest return to the house. Oh, welcome, father. Father, I charge thee by thy reverence here to unfold, though lately we intended to keep in darkness what occasion now reveals before tis ripe, what thou dost know hath newly passed between this youth and me. A contract of eternal bond of love, confirmed by mutual joinder of your hands, attested by the holy close of lips, strengthened by interchangement of your rings, and all the ceremony of this compact, sealed in my function by my testimony, since when my watch hath told me, toward my grave I have travelled but two hours. Ho, oh, thou dissembling cub! What wilt thou be when time hath sowed a grizzle on thy case? Or will not else thy craft so quickly grow that thine own trip shall be thine overthrow? Farewell, and take her. But direct thy feet where thou and I henceforth may never meet. My lord, I do protest. Oh, do not swear. Hold little faith, though thou hast too much fear. Sir Toby's good friend, Sir Andrew, limps into the front yard, clutching a fresh wound on his forehead. For the love of God, a surgeon! Send one presently to Sir Toby! Uh, what's the matter? He has broke my head across and has given Sir Toby a bloody coxcomb too. For the love of God, your help! I had rather than forty bucks I were at home. Who has done this, Sir Andrew? The Count's gentleman, one Cesario. We took him for a coward, but he's the very devil incarnate. My gentleman, Cesario. <gasps> oh, it's lifelings, here he is. You broke my head for nothing. And that that I did, I was sent on to do it by Sir Toby. Why do you speak to me? I never hurt you. You <gasps> drew your sword upon me without cause, but I bespoke you fair and hurt you not. Oh, if a bloody coxcomb be a hurt, you have hurt me. I think you set nothing by a bloody coxcomb. Sir Toby limps into the yard, using Festy as a crutch. Just like Sir Andrew, Sir Toby clutches a bloody wound on his head. Here comes Sir Toby, halting. You shall hear more, but if he had not been in drink, he would have tickled you other gates than he did. How now, gentlemen? Uh, how is it with you? Oh, that's all one. He's hurt me. Mm. And there's the end on it. Sot. Did Cetic surgeon Sot. Oh, he's drunk, Sir Toby. An hour agone. His eyes were set at eight of the morning. Then he's a rogue. And a passy measures pan. And I hate a drunken rogue. Mm -hmm. uh, away with him. Who hath made this havoc with them? I'll help you, Sir Toby. Because we'll be dressed together. Will you help? An asshead, mm -hmm. and a coxcomb, and a knave, a thin-faced knave, a gull. Oh. 
Get him to bed, and let his hurt be looked to. Sir Toby, Sir Andrew, Fabian, Festy, and Mariah scurry away in search of a doctor. Sebastian emerges from the house and rushes to Olivia's side. I am sorry, madam, I have hurt your kinsman. But had it been the brother of my blood, I must have done no less with wit and safety. You throw a strange regard upon me, and by that I do perceive it hath offended you. Pardon me, sweet one, even for the vows we made each other but so late ago. One face, one voice, one habit, and two persons. A natural perspective that is and is not. Antonio, oh, my dear Antonio, how have the hours racked and tortured me since I have lost thee? Sebastian, are you? Fearst thou that, Antonio? How have you made division of yourself? An apple cleft in two is not more twin than these two creatures. Which is Sebastian? Most wonderful. Sebastian notices the man across the lawn, who looks identical to himself. Viola makes a similar observation. They stare at one another in disbelief. Do I stand there? I never had a brother. I had a sister whom the blind storms and surges have devoured. Of charity, what kin are you to me? What countryman, what name, what parentage? Of Messaline? Sebastian was my father, such as Sebastian was my brother too. So when he suited to his rocky tomb, if spirits can assume both form and suit, you come to fright us. A spirit I am indeed, but am in that dimension grossly clad, which from the womb I did participate. Were you a woman, as the rest goes even, I should my tears let fall upon your cheek and say, Thrice welcome, once dead Viola. My father had a mole upon his brow. And so had mine. And died that day when Viola from her birth had numbered thirteen years? Oh, that record is lively in my soul. He finished indeed his mortal act that day that made my sister thirteen years. If nothing lets to make us happy both but this my masculine usurped attire, I am Viola, which to confirm I'll bring you to a captain in this town where lie my maiden weeds, by whose gentle help I was preserved to serve this noble count. All the occurrence of my fortune since hath been between this lady and this lord. Sebastian turns to Olivia apologetically. So comes it, lady, you have been mistook. But nature to her bias drew in that he would have been contracted to a maid. Nor are you therein, by my life, deceived. You are betrothed both to a maid and man. Be not amazed. Right noble is his blood. If this be so, as yet the glass seems true, I shall have share in this most happy wreck. Boy, thou hast said to me a thousand times thou never shouldst love woman like to me. And all those sayings I will overswear, and those swearings keep as true in soul as doth that orbed continent the fire that severs day from night. Give me thy hand, and let me see thee <laughs> in thy woman's weeds. <laughs> the captain that did bring me first on board hath my maid's garments. He upon some action is now endurance at Malvolio's suit, a gentleman and follower of my lady's. He shall enlarge him. And yet alas, now I remember me, they say, poor gentleman, he's much distract. Festy, sensing he could be very useful in this situation, runs out of the house with Malvolio's letter. A most exacting frenzy of mine own for my remembrance clearly banished his. How does he, Sira? Truly, madam. He holds Beelzebub at the stave's end as well as a man in his case may do. Has he read a letter to you? I should have given to you today morning, but as madman's epistles are no gospels, so it skills not much when they are delivered. Open it and read it. Look then to be well edified when the fool delivers the madman. By the Lord, uh, madam! How now? Art thou mad? No, madam. I do but read madness. And your ladyship will have it as it ought to be. You must allow Vox. Prithee, read in thy right wits. So I do, madonna. Uh, but to read his right wits is to read thus. Therefore, perpend, my princess, and give ear. Read it you, Sira. <clears throat> By the Lord, madam, you wrong me, and the world shall know it. Though you have put me into the darkness, giving your drunken cussing rule over me, Yet have I the benefit of my senses as well as your ladyship. I have your own letter that induces me to the semblance I put on, with the which I doubt not, but to do myself much right, or you much shame. Think of me as you please. I leave my duty a little unthought of, and speak out of my injury. The madly used Melvolio. Did he write this? Mm, aye, madam. This savors not much of distraction. 
See him delivered, Fabian. Bring him hither. Fabian races into the house to free Malvolio. My lord, so please you these things further thought on to think me as well a sister as a wife. One day shall crown the alliance on it, so please you here at my house and at my proper cost. Madam, I am most apt to embrace your offer. Cesario, your master quits you, and for your service done him, and since you called me master for so long, here is my hand. You shall from this time be your master's mistress. <laughs> A sister, you are she. Fabian drags Malvolio out of the house by his arm. Is this the madman? Aye, my lord, this same. How now, Malvolio? Madam, you have done me wrong. Notorious wrong! Have I, Malvolio? No. Lady, you have. Pray you, peruse that letter. Malvolio hands her another letter. The one Mariah wrote to look like it was from Olivia. You must not now deny it is your hand. Write from it if you can, in hand or phraser. Say tis not your seal nor your invention. You can say mm. a none of this. Well, grant it then, and tell me in the modesty of honor why you have given me such clear lights of favor. Bade me come smiling and cross gartered to you to put on yellow stockings and to frown upon Sir Toby and the lesser people. Why have you suffered me to be imprisoned, kept in a dark house, visited by the priest, and made the most notorious geck and gold that air invention played on? Tell me why. Alas, Malvolio, this is not my writing. Huh? Though I confess much like the character, but out of question tis Mariah's hand. And now I do bethink me, it was she first told me thou wast mad, then camest in smiling and in such forms which here were presupposed upon thee in the letter. Prithee, be content. This practice hath most shrewdly passed upon thee. But when we know the grounds and authors of it, thou shalt be both the plaintiff and the judge of thine own cause. Oh, good madam, hear me speak, and let no quarrel nor no brawl to come tame the condition of this present hour which I have wondered at. In hope I shall not, most freely I confess, myself and Toby set the device against Mavolio here upon some stubborn and courteous parts we have conceived against him. Mariah writ the letter at Sir Toby's great importance. In recompense whereof he had married her? How, were as poor for malice it was followed, may rather pluck on laughter than revenge? If that the injuries be justly weighed, they have on both sides passed. Alas, poor fool, how have they baffled thee? <laughs> Why, some are born great, some achieve greatness, and some have greatness thrown upon them. I was one, sir, in this interlude, one, Sir Topus, sir, but that's all one. By the Lord, fool, I am not mad. <laughs> but do you remember, uh, madam, why laugh you at such a barren rascal, and your smile not he's get? <laughs> oh, and thus... The whirligig of time brings in his revenges. I'll be revenged. On the whole pack of you! <laughs> Malvolio stomps away, planning to take a few days off before he returns to the tortures of Olivia's household. He hath been most notoriously abused. Pursue him and entreat him to appease. He hath not told us of the captain yet. <laughs> when that is known and golden time convinced... A solemn combination shall be made of our dear souls. Meantime, sweet sister, we will not part from hence. Cesario, come, for, for so you shall be while you are a man. But when in other habits you are seen, Orsino's mistress and his fancy's queen. When that I was, and a little tiny boy with a hay, ho, oh, the wind and the rain, a foolish thing was but a toy for the rain, it raineth every day. But when I came to man's estate with a hay, ho, oh, the wind and the rain, against knaves and thieves, men shut their gate for the rain, it raineth every day. But when I came, alas, to wife with a hay, Ho, oh, the wind and the rain, by swaggering could I never thrive, for the rain it raineth every day. But when I came unto my bed with the hay, ho, oh, the wind and the rain, with toss spot still had drunken heads, for the rain it raineth every day. No, 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 no. What a joyful no, turn no, of no, events! No, no. 
Sir Toby and Mariah have married, Sebastian and Olivia have married, and Orsino and Viola are engaged to be married. Although our story took some serious twists and turns, it looks like things have actually worked out for the residents of Illyria. This train is finally back on the right track. Great while ago, the world begun with a hey, ho, the wind and the rain. But that's all one, our play is done. And we'll strive to please you every day. Thank you so much for tuning into our production of Twelfth Night, the radio show. The lovely voices you heard today were those of Grace Handicus, Will Clemens, Bob Lynch, Mia Shaker, Ryder Sadler, Ingrid Kenyon, Will Wheatley, Alexandra Figueroa, Silas Hayes, Lex Schwartzman, Casey Brenneman, C.T. Cordero, and Shannon Hughes. Sound designed by Arian Crocker with original theme music by Michael McNulty. Twelfth Night was directed by Avery Erskine with assistance from Charlie Moose and Tanaka Mubavarirwa. This radio program was made possible by the Miller Art Scholars Program, WTJU, and William Shakespeare. For more information on this production's cast and crew, visit shakespeareonthelawn.org. This is Molly Rose Smith, speaking. <laughs>